couple of years ago, I told you, you watch did. out for Super Johnny McGinn. What a player. You should be a manager, Michael. Are you going to be my assistant or what? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rest is Football. I'm Gary Lineker and joining me as usual are the wonderful pairing, um, don't know who wrote that, of Alan Shearer <laughs> and Micah Richards. Um, how are you both doing? Very busy weekends, I know, which is why our podcast is out slightly later uh, on a Monday than it normally is. I, I, I don't want to depress you by starting with um, Newcastle just yet, um, Alan, <laughs> but... Um, a, a tough weekend for some and a better weekend for others, Micah. Um, yeah, it's been a good weekend. Uh, Spurs were fantastic. Man City back to winning ways. Fulham, ecstatic performance with a 5-0 win. And the doom and gloom continues with Chelsea, a team I tipped oh to be very good this season and very much letting me down yeah. by the brilliant Everton. Right, let's start this week with the Rwanda policy. Um, as I'm on the front page. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Who are you upsetting now, <laughs> don't, don't, All the right people, Alan. All the right oh, people. Right, okay. It's funny if the Daily Mail were an individual. I think they'd be done uh, for stalking with their strange paranoia and weirdness around me. But anyway, we'll, we'll move on to football. I'll stick to football. Let's do that. Yes, please. That's quite yeah. a good name for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, God, I think I, I, I'm sorry, Alan, but we, we, we've got to start with the Spurs Newcastle game, which I thought even um, I thought was was tremendous. Um, I mm. thought Newcastle had a go in the first half; um, it was end to end, but um, they were really dominated. Overall, excellent performance uh, from Spurs against a, I suppose, a jaded uh, looking Newcastle. That I don't quite. Oh come I on! I don't quite buy that. Oh, well, you, did you ever hearing. feel jaded in your day? You just get on with it, don't you? You just roll your sleeves up. In fairness to Eddie Howe and the players, I've never heard one of them say that they're tired. Correct. But all I keep hearing is reporters and mm. pundits and presenters saying how tired they are. They must be because the the same team have had to play five times in a row. I mean, forgive me for thinking anything different, but isn't it? Job to play football. That's not what they get paid for. <laughs> no, come on mean? now. Come on. We've... The one thing, the one thing that has happened, Micah, is that they're not able to change it in the last twenty minutes. Other than the, other than that, the eleven that they put out is really good. But the, the the thing that they're missing is being able to change it in the last twenty or twenty five minutes because of lack of options and the, with the injuries that they've had. So I don't I don't go along with the tiredness thing, um, and I'll never accept that players play too much football because they have the best sports science they have the best pitches they have the best physios um they have the best of everything they don't sit on coaches now for six hours they sit on private jets um so i'm i'm always reluctant to say about players playing too much football but i i would disagree with 10 percent. I, I agree with you what you're saying al but i believe the game's moved on and i'm talking about physically I'm not talking that the game is the game. And I just believe the output of the modern day players. So when I started my career, I could play yeah. three games a week. No problem at all. I was a little bit lighter. Um, my body could <laughs> deal with it. When I started moving through my career, when I got to 25, 26, 27, th those ages there, I really did feel it. I used to be able to have one day recovery back in training. Yep. The later it goes on, it took me two days to recover. To recover from your big night out after the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. But in terms of the quality that they're playing as well, if they was playing just Premier League teams, I would agree with you a little bit more, but they're going to the Champions League. And we was there on the PSG night and it took all the emotion out of them. And sometimes when you've got a younger squad who are not used to dealing with it, it be can become difficult, especially when the, they've got probably 10 key players out. So I had a little bit of sympathy for them. The game, I think without doubt, the, yeah. game, is, um, the game is quicker these days, but I think the support um, 
for the players has travelled a lot faster in the game. Yeah, you know why mm. it's quicker so, though, Alan? Don't you? It's the playing surfaces. That's what's made the well. That's what I'm that's saying. Made the game quicker. Every but single, they don't everything. have to f- trawl through thick mud. I mean, you want to try doing that as well. I mean, I hate going. I'm not one of those that ever goes. Oh, in my day, it was so much better. I think the game is way better now than it than than it ever was in my time be- mm. because of things like the playing surface and stuff. But even you know, even take a World Cup for example, which is probably is an exhausting month of football that you could possibly play. And you play every three days, every four days. Um, usually, well, it's always in the summer if it's Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we played in Mexico. It's 40-odd degrees pretty much every game we played. Um, it was tough. Um, but would you ever want to miss a game? No. Would you ever want to come off with 10 minutes to go? No. You just you just kind of fight. You, you, you determination and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's the thing, and I, I repeat again, that I don't think that a lot of the players will ever say that they don't want to play football. Most of them will say, oh, well, do you want to rest today? And the, the, every one of them will say, well, no, I'd rather play. But the, 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 the problem is, is that from the age of seven, for the last 20 years, all we've ever heard and all that's always been pumped into young kids is that you can't play three games a week. You play too much football. Do me a Favor, will you? Absolutely, Alan. And I'll make I'll I'll say one thing about you. In the in the last twenty years, the two greatest footballers on this planet have hardly missed a football match. Correct. Um you know, people say, yeah, but Messi walks around. But, you know, going back when he was playing for Pep, they were pressing and pressing and pressing and you know, uh, so it's it's meant. It's. I think it's. It's. It's a mental thing as much you're as told, anything else. If you're told if, enough times, if you're told enough times, you can't play three games a week. Yeah. Eventually, you believe you're going to believe. Yes, it. but Ronaldo and Messi. To be fair to them, they were luxury players. We didn't see Ronaldo. Part of the problem when Ronaldo not, not in their prime, left. Micah. In yeah. the last few years, yes, not in their prime. Not when they were in their late tw- in their twenties or even early thirties. That has only really come about in the last few years they, they you know they both of them would have at times really played the high press and stuff with i mean messi with, with, when peps you can't play in a pep side without without pressing but they they dictate the ball more often than not so if you look at the sprints with a, mm. a manchester city say uh they might have uh better sprints or higher sprints over the first five yards to get the ball back but they're not running as much as the other teams chasing them, you know? Well, let me take you to, to something that a certain um, hero of, um, of, of yours said, Thierry Henry. What is the hardest thing in football? The hardest thing in football is running with the ball. Now, both Ronaldo and Messi, Messi in particular, obviously, do that. The hardest thing is dribbling because people are wrestling you, fighting you, you're twisting, you're turning. That is the most physical aspect of football. Um, you know, I think obviously the, the medical side of things is great. And, 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 and I'm sure um, scientifically, um, yes, players will be better if they only play once a week and they'll be fitter and stronger. But I also think, you know, how, I can't, how, how many games in your career, Alan, did you play where you thought, I feel absolutely 100% today? No, hardly, hardly ever. ever. Be- and, and also, I mean, again, I'm doing that thing where you go back in my day and it is different now. But... You know, what was it? One sub? <laughs> One yeah. sub when I started. Two by the now? time 25. I finished. Now you can have like You've got a 25-man squad and you can bring, yeah. what, five subs anyway, on? Anyway, so. that's enough of the old man's <laughs> rant. That's the old <laughs> men are having a rant What here. we need to say is, or what I need to say is, Spurs absolutely battered Newcastle yes. and by far the better sure. team and... Um, had my neutral hat on, the way they have their fullbacks playing, I mean, yes, it's high risk because Newcastle should have scored two goals in the first half with with yes. um, with catching Spurs out. But they didn't, and Spurs punished them for that. But the Spurs battered Newcastle. They were a much better team. Um, I love the way Ange and yeah. the way they play. Yeah, it's it's, exciting, it's, isn't it's it? so yeah. exciting. That's what football yeah. that should be about. And also, it brings me on to a topic, not just about Tottenham, because I'm talking about other other teams as well, like really having a go at teams that, you know, normally are better. And we saw that with Aston Villa, certainly against Manchester City in midweek, didn't we? Um, it, we we're not seeing anymore, te- or well, we are, but not as frequently. Teams just come, take Bournemouth at Manchester United on Saturday. They had a real go, high wow. press went for them. And teams are getting rewards for that now, whereas before... 
teams would go to Manchester City or possibly Manchester United when they were playing better and stuff. And they'd sit and sit and sit and lose 2-0. Yeah. But now they're having a go. Now they might get the odd thumping for that, but it's much better for the game when these teams do that. And it's rewarding. Yeah. I think even, I mean, you look at David Moyes and, Ever- and West Ham, the way he's sort of... Hmm. I mean, he's been around for God knows how long, Moyes, and had a great career. But even he's had to slightly change and think, and and the thought process is they probably have to go for games a little bit more. And what I what I saw it. I mean, I, I was at the game on Thursday evening when Spurs played West Ham, and Spurs battered West Ham for the first half. But then West Ham came out in the, in the second half and had a right go, and then ended up getting all all three points. Well, if they carried it so on, if they carried it on yesterday, of... it didn't quite work. <laughs> no, <laughs> didn't, it didn't work for them yesterday. They got bad. But I think even I think everyone's had to sort of change their I don't know style of play, if you like, because that is that is football nowadays, and you have to. I think it's accepted that you have to play that way, which is great. It's more entertaining, and mm. much more enjoyable, yeah. Micah. Uh, uh, yes, it is, and. Um, I... We talk about enjoyment. We have to talk about the Spurs fullbacks, the inverted oh. fullbacks. I did a piece yesterday on match of the day two, and we've talked about Trent doing it at Liverpool, Cancelo mm. at Man City, but uh, Udogi and mm. Poro yesterday yeah, were magnificent. But it's not just yeah. getting in there. When they're getting it, they're doing it with a purpose. They're playing through balls. When they build up, they go straight in there. They don't wait to leave the space for Johnson or Kuliseski coming from the, the number 10 position or Son leaving the space for out wide. And then the movement with Richarlison. I just think Spurs now, no matter what, they, they might not finish top two. They might not challenge for the league like we was potentially saying a couple of weeks ago. But it's just a joy to see a team on the front foot, like you said, Gary. It's brilliant, really. Yeah. Is and, and two goals uh, for Richarlison. It's it's funny. I didn't realise till I saw the stat yesterday that it's the first time he'd scored for Spurs uh, with either of his feet, and then in the, and then he scores another one with with his feet. So two mm. in the in the same game. Um, football's a daft thing, isn't it? But he <laughs> he was he was full of energy. So um, you you we've we've said this before, haven't we? He just needs to get his confidence, and he could go. Uh, banging in a few goals. Um, is this? Uh, can you see any way that that Newcastle can bounce back in midweek, Alan? Because it's a big one yeah. for them against Milan. Yeah, I can. They're great. It's They're a, a different side game. at home as well, aren't they? Yeah, I, I said that yesterday when I did PLP yesterday, Premier League television. Um, it's totally different when you're at home. You've got the backing of the crowd. They got two players back uh, yesterday in Longstaff and in Wilson, who came in, came on for the last 25 mm-hmm. minutes ish, and, and looked decent. So I would imagine they'd be involved. Um, and Milan have got a few injuries as well. So I'd be more than confident that Newcastle can bounce back on Wednesday because the atmosphere will be electric again. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's not in their hands. Even if they win, it might not be enough. But the likelihood is, I think, that um, that Dortmund will do a job on PSG because I'm not, I don't think they're a great team. No, I, I wouldn't disagree with you on that. Um, Chelsea. Oh, what, oh. I mean, I mean, we we all thought, didn't oh we, that God. you know, get the right man in charge. But I think it's a, it's perhaps a little bit of a similar scenario to to Manchester United. It, it doesn't seem to be, you know, being run oh. well at the top, and they, you know, they they they're such a random. I mean, did you did you hear Potch yesterday after the game saying about the need for players in January? Yeah, I mean, they've spent. A it fortune. was only what six or seven, eight months ago we were saying they got too many players, <laughs> and I think I think if I'm not wrong in saying. I think in the last two years or 18 months, it's something like 960 million, just under a billion that they've spent on players. And I know he, he wasn't involved yesterday, but they've spent all of that. And this the, the, a 40-year-old, a 39-year-old is still their best centre off in silver. Yeah. And they haven't got a centre forward. <laughs> and whoever, well, they have I mean, whoever forward, is working. buying those players to give to the coach someone needs to seriously have a look at themselves because whatever they're giving the coach at the minute is nowhere near good enough and they're spending an absolute fortune on players and wasted so much and giving them, a lot of them, eight-year contracts. Yeah. Oh, my it's goodness. Extraordinary. You know what the, the mad thing is about Chelsea? They had 71% possession yesterday and they're still not creating enough clear-cut chances. They're creating half chances 
And Broya played okay. He tried to run in behind, tried to ruffle the fence a little bit. But I just, they need a striker. They need a striker ASAP. They're not easy to find, though, are they? Seriously, though, how can you spend <laughs> just under a billion pound and not have a centre forward? I mean, I know. well, they had Lukaku, didn't they? they? That didn't work out for them. I mean, they've got Jackson and Kunku's injured and just trying to get, get back, but... <laughs> you see Lukaku's I mean, challenge yesterday? No. He got no. he got a red card. He oh. lunged in. It was a bit of a dangerous one. Chasing back. Um, he'd scored as well in that game. Um I was watching a bit of foreign football um, last night as well. With, <laughs> yeah, they're um, really, yeah, they're really poor yeah. up top, Chelsea. Yeah, they really, really are. really poor up front. But are, are we are we being ultra nice because Poch is such a nice guy, or is it not? Is he coming to this, and were we sort of naive thinking that he could put it right straight away, or because mm. if this was any other manager, I think they'd be getting so uh, a little bit more pelters, if I'm being totally honest. But we know what he could do. He's a lovely chap, but... <sighs> when does it get to the point where... I'm not saying he's under pressure, but questions need to be asked of the the manager as well. Well, hang on a minute, Micah. Let's look at the Tuchel. Hmm. Lampard, Pochettino... Am I missing one? Well, Tuchel sort of went, didn't he, before around the time that Bowley came in because he clearly, yeah, he's, I think he obviously saw what was coming here. He probably saw a bit of disarray at the top of the club and thought, I need to get out. Or who knows, it might have been the other way around. I think there was an aspect of Bowley wanted to sign players of, and, and um, Tuchel's going, no, I don't want him. I think it was Ronaldo issue as well. So... Um, I think maybe Tuchel, <laughs> Tuchel saw um, saw what was coming, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's I, I mean, I, I, it's just absolutely staggering what's gone on and going on at uh, at Chelsea, and they're going to have to be patient because that ain't the quick fix job. And patience isn't mm-hmm. something associated with Chelsea Football Club over the years. I know it's different owners now. Um, I mean, I, I like I like Poch, and I think if given time, it, it'll get it right. But I'm. <laughs> I mean, when you spent that amount of money in there, twelfth, I think, yeah. at this moment in time, yeah. um, probably, I think they were eleventh or twelfth mm. when he took over. I think that, something while, like that, wouldn't they? Whilst we're on this game, I think we should definitely give Sean Dyche and Everton a, a serious mention. Amazing. If Everton hadn't had the two point ten point deduction, they would be now ninth in the league. Um, which speaks volumes for what he's done. That's three wins on the bounce now. Um, you know they they play his way. Um, he's uh, and it's working for them. It's it's it really is. And you know if you'd have said Brilliant. at the start of the season Everton join this season, we'll get a ten point deduction, and will they stay up? You'd have gone. Poor. Yeah. Really, really difficult. Yeah, he's doing a great job, isn't he, Mike? He's, I mean, he's brilliant. He's got them going. The crowd have reacted. That everyone sort of reacted in the positive way that we thought they would do. That it was going to be the mentality of us against the world and. That's that's working for them at the minute, and Sean's doing a brilliant job. I think the the good thing uh, with Everton, they look a lot more settled now. I think Garner coming into the team has been outstanding. McNeil's playing to the level mm-hmm. that got him his accolades at Burnley. Young Branthway at the back mm, was yeah. amazing. He's gonna he's going to the very top. He's going to the very top, and just his decision making. He, he, he reads the game well, he's quick enough, makes the right decision. He's got an experienced head with Tarkovsky beside him and he's got a manager who loves the defensive side of the game. So I just think marry all them together, they deserve all the credit. They're too really early good. for Branthwaite for the Euros, No, nope, No, nope, not nope. too early. I would take him. I would mm. take him, get him the experience. I mean... If you look at the centre halves, you're looking at Maguire, Stones, possibly uh, Colwell, uh, Gehi, 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 yes, yes, Gehi. we got, we got <laughs> Gehi. Um, you're looking at Dunk, but there's not a great amount. Is that I would take him for the experience, not put too much pressure on him. You remember when um, was it Bellingham 
not the last tournament, and I think I said a couple of years ago, I don't want him to start because I don't want too much pressure, but take him, give him the experience mm. because he's going to go to the very top. He really is. We, we seem to do this quite a lot. Manchester United in a pickle. But before we get to Manchester United, um, Bournemouth, form team um, of the month. I, funnily enough, when Ten Hag was given manager of the month, I thought it should have gone to Iraola um, for what the way he turned things around there. Uh, and then they gave uh, United a good thumping <laughs> at, at Old Trafford. And um, um, doing match of the day on Saturday night and Jermaine was saying, um, and I sort of agree with him, he, he, he was saying he cannot see what Ten Hag's plan is and, and what is his style of play. Uh, um, it just doesn't seem to have stamped his authority on things. Or is it a case like we've said with Poch, where you know, probably needs more time or um, can you see things turning around at, at, at Old Trafford? Is it, is it the, are the problems right at the top, which we talked about the trickle down effect. Um, you've mentioned it lots of times, Alan, um, yeah. but it's hard to, it's hard to see what they're trying to do on the pitch, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I mean, they were, they were, they were rotten again, weren't they? I mean, two of two of those in three games, because I, I was at um, I was at Old Trafford in midweek when they mm. played Chelsea, and it was a, they were much better. They well. had more energy. Mm. Um, uh, they played well. Should have won by more. And I thought, mm, okay, but then to put another performance in at home in front of your own fans, I thought, mm, yeah, it's. I mean, we've said it before. There's problems at that football club, and who's making decisions, where they're going, how they're going to get there, when's it going to happen. It's. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they could finish... I said it before. They could finish fourth or they could finish eighth or ninth. I haven't got a clue. It's a bit of a basket case club, isn't it, at the minute? I, I just think that from top to bottom, people, because of the size of Man United, the players, the staff, even behind the scenes, they can't deal with the pressure of what comes with Manchester United. We've talked tactically. Tactically, they're not good enough. Um, Alan, Alan said it. You don't really know what the what what they're trying to do. Although when I, I, we know what they're trying to do in terms of get the ball wide, you know they want wingers to come inside, play the ball, but we're not seeing it. And then off the field, there's a story every single week about Man United because they're the biggest club mm. in in England. So that comes with added pressure and being a pro. I just believe the standards have dropped and when the standards drop, the confidence drops and then it's hard to get back. When you've got teammates like Matic coming out and saying players were late. What, what, what do you mean players were late? Like, for as much as the the laughing and joking and the fun we have as of players, you're never late to to your job and something you love to do. And if that is the standard, how are you supposed to when it comes on the pitch and you look left and right and in front of you, or oh, I know he's got my back, I know he's gonna run, you know, hundred percent for me. And that's what you're seeing to just look too disjointed. It's not just one and two players, it's everyone. It's absolutely we've been, in the, we've been in the game long enough, us three, to, to know. know. Yes. Looking looking at that performance and looking at that, their attitudes, that is not a happy camp. It's not a happy dressing no, room. Not. The splits in the dressing room, you can see it, I can tell. I don't know, but I'm just looking at the body language of players and looking at him taking the captaincy from Maguire. I look at him, the problem he ha he's got with Sancho. I look at it, Marcus Rashford's body language. Uh, I look at, uh, I mean... It's uh, wherever I look, I just see problems. What's the answer? How do they get out of this this mire? Well, the answer's in? got to start from the top. They've got to sort the top out first, the very top, and then eventually, as I keep saying, other things will happen. But when, how? how I mean, it's just it's it affects everything. Sure does. Um, Bournemouth, we can't <laughs> we can't not we can't not give them the, them credit. It was a fabulous performance. Um, I saw a quote from, um, it was Dominic Solanke saying, uh, I think we've just started clicking. At the beginning, under Andoni Iraola, we were still trying to find our feet with a new philosophy. We've definitely started gelling in the last few weeks and it's showed 
on the pitch. And and that's probably um, an advert really, isn't it? For managers to have a way of playing and stick to that way of playing until you ingrain it into into the footballers and, and the philosophy and, and the style and the shape. And it certainly seems to be taking effect. And we, you know, all of us had our doubts early in the season, but mm-hmm. um, we, but even you, Mike, you were saying even early in the season, you could say, I can see what they're trying to do. I can see, and it will come. And you were right. Yeah, I, I could see what they were trying to do. There was pressing really higher. There was trying the rotations. There was pushing further up the field, trying to box the other team in. But, Let's have it right. The, the reason why they're doing well is because they've bought into what the manager wants and they're finishing off the chances. How many times have we talked about Bournemouth? They're getting good positions and then they squander their chances. Solanke is in the form of his life. Semenya's playing really well also. The the fullback Kirkes is having a couple of the, the best games I've seen, the fullbacks this season as well. They're just... It's clicking and it's clicking at the right time. And when you get a, a few results, it breeds confidence and allows you to, to buy in more what the manager's telling you. As soon as you get a couple of results, you're like, oh, actually, this works. The, the strikers are, are scoring goals. The midfielders are playing the forward passes. The, the fullbacks are overlapping and, and getting involved. And they're solid at the back. Go to Old Trafford and get a, a clean sheet. It just breeds that confidence. Shows you as well, Alan, doesn't it? The, the the mental side of the game is 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 hmm. so huge, isn't it? I mean, you oh, yeah. you're talking about it is in any sport, Gary, in any isn't sport, it? in uh, yeah. probably in all sorts of uh, walks of life, but um, certainly in sport, if it's that thing in between the ears, and don't yeah. start, Alan, don't start. <laughs> 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 um, the, Some have got a bigger thing in between the ears, isn't it? a bigger brain. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'll take that yeah, compliment, exactly. Alan. Um, we've got really? lots more to discuss um, when we come back from the break, uh, including Manchester City uh, winning again and a first victory uh, for Sheffield United, amongst other things. But for now, um, let's take a short breather to get our mental strength. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Micah Richards and Alan Shearer. Uh, we're reviewing um, the Premier League weekend of football, which um, was once again very entertaining as it was in midweek. Got some cracking games. Um, let's talk about Aston Villa. Um, yeah. Within the space of, um, what was it, four days, beating Manchester City with a, an extraordinary performance. And then probably a little bit of a different kind of performance against Arsenal. Um, but they managed to win both those games by a goal to nil. Um, your former club, Micah, obviously <laughs> doesn't look anything like the club that when you were playing for them. But... <laughs> Cheers, Gary. <laughs> um, yeah, they got a decent right back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got a decent team. They got they, decent I mean, I mean, they really have. And um, your mate John McGinn was, was terrific again. Hey, Ooh. what did I tell you? A couple of years ago, I told you, he watch did. out for Super Johnny McGinn. What a player. What McGinn a player he is. <laughs> I mean... You should be a manager, Michael. I, I, you know what? I might get into it, actually. Are you going to be my assistant or what? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this on my own. <laughs> <laughs> but I just... No, oh. when you play with someone, I always... We was at Aston Villa and we had Grealish. And Grealish was the main man. He was the one who made things tick. He was the flair player. He was the mm. golden boy. But McGinn did all the hard work, but mm. had a great left foot, super strong. People don't understand how strong he is. When he bursts through and you try and like get the ball off him, he gets his big ass in there and he just, <laughs> he's got a great stance where he just says, Get off me. Great acceleration. The right passing. And a lot of people laugh when he come down from, from Scotland or can he mix it in the Premier League. After the first training session, I was like, wow, he could shoot. He could tackle. He was good in possession. And it makes it even better when he's a super nice guy. So when he's sort of showing this form, he had a little bit of dip. He had a dip. Was it last season or the end of the season before where you're thinking, come on, 
We need more from you. You're supposed to be the one that's going to lead this team. But then he's got his form back. He's just oozing with confidence. And he's just putting in performance after performance after performance. And I just knew he would come to this. He was linked with Man United and Liverpool um, a while ago. But how good for him? He doesn't need to move. He's in a team which is he's fighting for the Champions well, League. Well, he can't move. He's got that big an arm. <laughs> That's what you've got here you go. Here's a question for you. The best arse in football. And I'm talking about the way you use it when you play football. Ooh, what are we talking? Used to be Mark Hughes. I was, was going to I was give you another one, Alan, that, that, that you played for. Kenny Dow Glish was unbelievable yeah. at easing his way into people and getting them on the half I'm going to I'm going to throw Go Aguero on. into that conversation yes. yeah. he was yeah. low sense of gravity he couldn't get the ball off him mm. wow when I was at Southampton Chris Nickel left me out of a game against mm. Man United to see it I just want you to sit and watch Mark Hughes see how he backs mm. into players see how he does it all and what have you and um, yeah and then of course I went to Blackburn with Kenny who was the master at it yeah. Uh, so th those two yeah. were unbelievable. You talked about Mark Hughes there. I remember we playing. We played against Mark Hughes. I can't remember which club he was at. We well, might have been Chelsea or Southampton. I don't know. Maybe even Man United at the time. Well, it was Tottenham against whoever they were, he was playing for at the time. And um, <laughs> Kaza just he kept shouting. <laughs> he kept shouting. <laughs> just let Mark Hughes have it. He'll back his way all the way to our own his own box. <laughs> <laughs> He'll shield it to his own box, he kept saying. Just let him have it. No, 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 yeah. I'm gonna throw in some <laughs> randoms as well, just just for uh, for context yeah. for the people. Yeah. And we're on Villa, John Carew. Oh, oh I remember John Carew. John yeah. Carew. Uh Jason Roberts. Oh, <laughs> horrible. Big Bunder. Uh. <laughs> You'll be going back to that DVD of yours, <laughs> your black booty, wasn't you? <laughs> oh, he texted me. He texted me like my landlord. Do you know did who was telling the story? Um, what did he say? God, brilliant. He said, <laughs> oh, he's brilliant. I asked him. He said black booty, and then he put like a hand over his uh, the head. Emoji. And I, yeah, and I said, "Do you remember it?" He said, "Of course I do." What you don't know is, while she was at training, I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant! Uh, superb. Brilliant. Uh, we asked this question last week. Um, what, what's the best Villa can do? They can't win the league, can they? Can't do a Leicester. I think eventually we said it. My my belief is, and they're, they're amazing. He's doing an unbelievable job, Unai Emery. Um, yeah, once they once they get back into January, February, I, whether they add or not, not, I don't know. But their squad wise will be pushed to the limit, I think, because of so many games. But they can certainly track. They can certainly push for top four. I've no doubt about that. But title no earlier on you were saying it doesn't matter how many games you play Alan now you've changed your team oh interesting freshness Gary depth of squad and as, in bringing, as in bringing other players on yeah, yeah. I know I'm only teasing and if Ollie Watkins gets an injury mm -hmm. do you think he's he's probably the yeah. I think he's, he's he's certainly key to to what they're doing and what they try to do definitely Manchester City back to winning ways, much to the relief of um, their ambassador, Michael Richards, no <laughs> doubt. Um, it, you know, they they just needed three points, didn't they? It wasn't it wasn't vintage City by any means, was it? No, it wasn't vintage. But I I really loved the role of um, Foden playing in that number ten role. Uh, mm, him and Alvarez too. sort of switching between ten and nine was was really good. I actually thought Luton did very well in containing them a lot of the time, but it was just get over the line. I was happy for Grealish as well. This whole Doku Grealish debate goes on. Who's more effective? And Grealish has showed, you know, why he's so important to this team away from... Your Rodri. man, Rodri back, man. Oh. What about his involvement for the first how, goal how, as well? How good is he? How good? Did we, we had a question, didn't we? Did we say Rodri yeah. or Rice? Come on, come on, guys. Yeah. Are, you, are you still sick? Rice is... He's, he's very good. Outstanding. No, no, <laughs> but, absolutely, but, but, I, no absolutely. We should change our mind um, by a performance for a player against Luton. <laughs> no, uh, no disrespect to Luton. I, think, I thought they had a real go yesterday. I thought they did really well. Uh, They're really competitive, Luton. And, I mean, they've taken Arsenal all the way. Liverpool as well there. 
and they push City all the way. So that I think that there's no expectation on them. It's a great atmosphere there. The managers very in tune of what what and who they are and um, they're being really competitive so I don't think they can ask any more than that I felt really sorry for them and they have been unlucky but you got to say well done to City for getting over the line just well, you sort of I, you, you, even at half time you thought oh, they've, they, they've got to turn this around don't yeah. you? but you're right obviously Rodri's a, a, a wonderful player with mm. um Sheffield United three points um just uh, Chris Wilder comes in um Second spell as manager of the club. He played for them as well, of course. You saw what it meant to him. Um, he's delighted to be back. I think we had him as a pundit in one game. Were you in that, Alan? Um, I was, a while yeah. Back. I like him. A lovely he's guy. Got a great, and, uh, um, yeah, he's got a great attitude. He knows Sheffield mm. it, uh, United inside out. Obviously been there. Um, he's, got a, he's got a huge task on his hands, but those three points will go a long way. I know they didn't get anything against Liverpool, wasn't it, in, the, in his first game, but he only had 24 hours, I think, to work with them. So um, it, that's what he'll try and do. That He'll try and make them competitive, particularly there at, uh, at home. But that's that's a good start for him, getting those three points. Yeah, you needed that. Brentford weren't at the best and obviously they had a few injuries um, as well. Um, but wonderful goal from um, James McAtee. Did you see Ooh. it? Where's he, where's he from? Where's he from? Oh, we know he's, he's a city. No, no. I mean, the way he moves, the guile on the voice, just, you can tell he's been brought up the correct way, can't you? Always looking to get on the ball. Lovely, both footed, but his strike was exceptional. It was good to see because he went on loan there last year, didn't he? I believe so. Uh, played really well. Uh, especially towards the back end of the season. And then it's always difficult when you come to the Premier League. Can you replicate it? You're always thinking, do you need to go back on loan to somewhere in the Championship to get the games? But he's come there, done very well, and he took his goal excellently well. So long may it continue. Mm. What about Fulham as well, by the way? Another five goals at home. Five then and five on uh, yesterday. Ten goals in two Credit games. Jimenez. Jimenez is back, Jimenez. guys. We, said it, we back. said it, didn't we? That yeah. if, he, if he knocks a couple in that confidence thing, a bit like possibly Richarlison might now do. Um, it's it, it, Again, it's that... that in, between yeah. the ears, Alan, between the ears. <laughs> <laughs> it's a confidence thing, isn't it? It's crazy how it happens, yeah. isn't it? It's like, it is it is bad. But I mean, with what, Awobi, William and uh, and him, mm. they've, they've got a decent front line, haven't they? I think the man manager deserves credit as well. Yes, I, mean, I was just about to yeah, say really that. Do. It's a little tweak as well that he did. He's brought back in Tom Kearney into mm. that centre midfield He's a really role. gifted player, Kearney, isn't he? I think he's underrated. Do you not think he's underrated? In the Championship, yeah. he was unbelievable. I remember when I was in the Championship thinking, who is this guy? And then yeah. he sort of come to the Premier League, didn't get as much games as, as you thought the yeah. second time round. I was thinking, yeah. he's so good on the yeah. ball. Lovely left foot, see a pass. He, he always looks to play forward. It gives a license for Wobi to go a bit more on 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 the wide, on, on down the width. And I just think he's he brings so much to this team, attacking-wise and control of the game. And the attitude of Paulinho, by the way, because oh, yeah. after the disappointment of what happened to him on transfer deadline, yeah, remarkable. Mm -hmm. for him, for him to, yeah. to come back and give the... I thought he was superb yeah. Speaking of... Well. Um, Tom Kearney, um, I, we have a group chat, one of our sister podcasts, The Rest is Entertainment, our new one, really. Oh, it's uh, flying, it, isn't it? It's doing very well with Richard Osman and <laughs> Marina Hyde. And I strongly recommend it, not just because it's one of ours, but, but because it's brilliant. Um, he's, Richard Osman, I don't know whether people know, he's a massive Fulham fan. Um, and he was, he was actually saying a, a week, a couple of weeks ago, actually, he said Ke Tom Kearney, one of the most underrated players in, in, in the Premier League. And... Um, Richard Osman knows his football. He knows his football. <laughs> Stick he to does. entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> He'll enjoy that. Uh, it's a bit like some to just stay out of politics, really, and stick to football, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely. Gary's <laughs> getting a transfer. The rest is politics by the end of the season. Get him signed I, up. I could get in that one as well. Oh, God, no, thank you very much. Um, humanitarian issues, I, I prefer to call them. <laughs> right, let's branch out a little to... Um, matters further afield um i don't know whether you noticed but bayern munich lost 5-1 mm. to um eintracht frankfurt 
at the weekend, um, which was an um, extraordinary result, really. Um, but it, the reason I want to talk about it is because of a conversation we had the week or so ago about um, XG, expected goals. Uh, Thomas Tuchel came out after the game and said, yeah, well, you know, they were the better side, yeah, blah, blah, blah. He said, but we won the expected goals. <laughs> He did. He, did he really? He I didn't did. hear he that. Said, Is that what he said? After the game, he said, yeah, you know, they, 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 we had more chances, you know, blah, blah, blah. We won the expected goals. Oh. Should give him three That's points. What, for that. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking uh, the, 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 the same thing. <laughs> Liverpool. Um, amazing how many times they've turned things around late in games um, this season. And also we should talk about Mo Salah. I know it was a, a, a deflection, but... Um, Mo Salah, what, 200 goals now. Um, what a consistent performer. Mike has spotted his talent when he was a young man at uh, Fiorentina. And um, he's, he's, he's so good, isn't he? He's so good. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Mm. I mean, his, everything about him is just brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. Goals, attitude, everything else. is What, what a player. Mm. I think he's, was it 150 goals? Premier League goals. He'd uh, mm. he scored now in, I mean, I don't know what it was, 240-odd goals. I mean, what an unbelievable record that is. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, Liverpool, Mike. <laughs> Look at Alan. Uh... <laughs> 247 games, 150 goals. Yeah. What an unbelievable record that is, Micah. <laughs> Uh, Why are you looking at me like that, Alan? Micah, what an unbelievable <laughs> record that <laughs> is. <laughs> Say, three times I've keyed you. It's, it's great for a winger, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you how easy it is, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on! But if, if, you, if you're like a salmon fisher at the moment, Alan, you're going like you're flicking your rod in. You've got the fly, then you're flicking it again. Come on, come on! Give him a mention, Two, Micah. 247. I mean, 150 and 247, Micah. What was your That's record, Alan? Record. What was your record? I think record? it was something like 211 or 12 Don't or something like that. You. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Oh, um, it's just <laughs> Micah, are Liverpool getting away with it, or is this the sort of thing that will mean they'll be right there at the end of the season? Will they? You know what I'm saying, don't you? The fact they're losing sometimes in these games is that a sign of weakness, or is it the fact that they're turning around a massive sign of strength? Uh, I would say it's a, a sign of strength. Mm. I think uh, Sabosli, we've talked about, adds another dynamic. I believe the substitutions of Curtis Jones and Harvey Elliott. And Harvey Elliott, he, he's almost not ready to play week in, week out for Liverpool, but he could play in any other Premier League team. He just gets on the ball, finds space and makes things happen. I feel he's, he's too good to be on the bench, but he wouldn't leave this Liverpool, if you know what I mean. And I just think the changes that Klopp made were brilliant. Salah, not even having to play well, but just scoring. Nunes, although he frustrates a lot of strikers, he still creates for other players to come into the pitch. You know, with Jota and, and, and Diaz, you're always going to get a goal. I think Liverpool are challenging. I don't think it's always going to be pretty because I feel they concede too many goals still. But I think they're in with a shout. I don't think they'll do it, but I think they'll challenge all the way. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if we got a really good tight title challenge, wouldn't it? I think we, I think, I think we're we gonna. might, yeah. I think we, we're gonna. I mean, yeah, City I have got to go away and play that three. World Club competition as well, yeah. which we, you know, that's a lot of travel um, to that few games, then come back, then have a, obviously there'll be a backlog of fixtures at some point for them as well. Um, Liverpool going well, obviously Arsenal right up there, Aston Villa even as well, and. I think Tottenham now bounce back. It's theirs to lose, really. <laughs> <Super sad>. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, over the weekend, there were a few discussions about VAR and actually mainly around the Arsenal-Aston Villa game. But they, it was more really the handball law that is at fault. But it's exacerbated, of course, by VAR because it gives them the opportunity to try and find these um, ridiculous um, decisions. And everyone was thinking it's a bit of a nonsense at the moment. So what I thought I'd do on um, 
I think it was Saturday, no, yesterday, I thought I'd do a poll on Twitter and I did the following. Should we keep VAR, can VAR, or just keep goal line technology and the offside aspect, particularly, I suppose, when it becomes automated? And the results are as follows. Um, And what did we get? Um... 100,000 votes. Now, that's a lot. If you did that in a political poll, not that I'm going to go into politics, <laughs> that would be, see, that's much bigger than they would normally do when they're trying to seek out um, views of people. So, keeping VAR, less than one in four, 23% of people would, would, of football fans would keep VAR. Can VAR, 30%. And the biggest with 47% was just keep goal line technology and offside. And I thought, so that's nearly 50%. But overall, you could say 77% of people would um, get rid of everything other than goal line technology and, and offside, which speaks volumes. I suspect if it was limited to just those fans that went to football matches, it would be... Um, I think there'd be even fewer people that would want to keep um, VAR. And now... I don't think, or I don't suspect that football will want to listen to what the fans think. Um, but maybe, maybe they should at least have a debate about it. What do we think? Well, my 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 thoughts about VAR going forward is is what we've been saying all season. We have to, as a fan, the fans in the stadium have to know what's going Correct. on. There has to be better communication. There has to be a time limit. I mean, it was nonsense what happened on um, Saturday with the dec- an hour and 45 or an hour and 50 seconds later. Is that there has to be a time limit on decisions and what have you. If you I Did mean, you say an hour and, and 50 you seconds rid of that. later? <laughs> and you, ha- you have to, you know, for me, I'd put a time limit on it. If, it's, if it takes longer than a minute, then it's clearly not clear and obvious. Mm. Or maybe change it indisputable. But maybe change the word to that. Do you not think they'll um, just keep trying to change it and fiddle with it? And that's where the, the, until I, I, is it, realistically is it actually workable? Because in the end, it's 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 still subjective, isn't it? It comes down mm-hmm. to somebody's opinion watching a television set. Um, and yeah. I, I, I mean, I I said on Saturday night on Match of the Day that I was an advocate of of bringing in VAR and and now I feel guilty about doing that I feel I was wrong I feel apologetic I don't mind admitting that I I just think it's it's had a negative effect on our wonderful sport yeah, yeah but that's only because it's not being used correctly how do you use it correctly? I just don't know how. You can say, well, you bring in X players, but I, 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 I go online and I'll look at like Twitter or X, I should say. And even on decisions that some people will say are clear and obvious, other people will disagree with it. So I just don't see, you. it'll never be perfect. It can't be perfect because it, it, it's subjective. And I think in when we all... I think when we envisaged VAR, we all thought what it would be there for would be the hand of God moment. Something absolutely incredibly obvious. But where do you draw the line at what is an absolute howler? For some people, one thing will be a howler and it won't be for another person. So I don't think it can ever be perfect. But I think in terms of the fans in the game i absolutely totally agree with alan they need to know what's going on they need to see it we need to see the images that they're seeing we need to hear the conversations that they're having between the var and the referee i think that would improve it Um, they need to make it very quick i think if you're going to stick with var the only way you can do it is like in other sports you have an appeal process you have maybe Two times in a game where a side is allowed to appeal a decision. Therefore, you know, if they get it wrong, you lose that appeal. If you get it right, you keep your two lives. A little bit li- like in cricket. But, um, and you're not stop starting it again, though. I mean, you're on about how it has to be quick. 
then you're saying, well, you're allowed an appeal and the game's going to be stopped again. Well, it, it, I, I just trying to think of ways and, and then have a, t- you know, and, uh, but, and bring in a time limit or something. But I, I, I don't is it know. really Is it really this difficult? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I think it really? is, Alan. Yeah, I do. Seriously? Yeah, I do. Like, I, I think it is honestly, complicated no. and difficult. I think, you know, you can try and tidy it up and obviously simplifying the laws, certainly around handball, would, would, would make it a lot. Let me just go back to the very beginning. Mm. It was brought in for the absolute howlers. And they said to us they weren't going to re-referee the game. Yeah, well, they are. Right? Exactly. Mm. So there's the the issue. Let's just, just the absolute. You said it. The Maradona moment. But how do you define what is an absolute? Indisputable. Instead of clear and obvious. Yeah. Just the, the the howlers. That's it. The absolute howlers. And if it if it takes one hour forty one hour one minute forty five seconds, it's too long. It's not disputable. It's not that obvious. Mm-hmm. If you've got to look at something ten times, it's not that obvious. I got I got um, a, a, a tweet asking. Actually, it was one of um, one of the tweets that was asking as a question for the question episode. But I'm going to stick it into this one now uh, from Simon Harris. Um, man behaving badly. Um, um, should they develop VAR further and have a panel of 100 TV viewers, uh, so five supporting each Premier League team, um, to live vote on every required decision? <laughs> I, I mean, he was joking. I make that clear. He's quite. A, he's quite a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's where it's leading, isn't it? It's, it's absolute. It's absolute madness. Um, I. I just think. I just think we will be here, honestly, if we're all still alive. <laughs> and I know what you're going to say, Alan. I'm on the 17th <laughs> green now um, of, in terms of my golfing life. Um, I, I think we'll be having the same conversation. I, I just don't think there's any way around it because I don't, they're not going to, well, they'll continue to try and tinker with it and meddle with it, but it's not going to get, I just, I don't envisage it getting any It doesn't better. help that, it doesn't help that the lawmakers keep, 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 mm. Keep changing the handball a lot either. I mean, they, they, they don't often make it difficult for referees sometimes because yeah. it's so pathetic, and they've got to think of so many things that it's just ridiculous. So they don't they don't help the referees and and sometimes in making the laws. But we will see. I think semi automated offsides next season. Get rid of it. Get yeah. rid of it. We've all we're sick of t- we're sick and tired Boring. of talking about it all the time, yeah. which is costing people. If the referee makes a bad decision in a game, you get on with it, like we all dealt with. Offsides, yes, we agree with that. The rest of it is is nonsense. Goal line technology, that's a different thing. Yes, we can have that. Everything else, get rid of. Simple yeah. as that. Okay, right. Uh, let's finish um, as we, we try to do on the Monday episode with um, moments of the week. I've got two, though. I've got two this week. Um, the first one, um, Girona, um, that a little tiny town in the north of Catalonia. I talked about it um, and, and what's going on there. They're doing a bit of a Leicester in La Liga. Um, they're right at the top. Um, they won away at Barcelona last night um, by four goals to two. Um and I know it's part of the City group before you mention it, um, Micah, but they've not really hardly spent any money on that particular club. It's tiny. They got up into the into La Liga um, just, what, 18 months ago. Um, it's, it's an incredible story if they carry on and it probably compete with Leicester if they go all the way. Um, I still suspect they won't because it would be a bit of a sporting miracle. So um, they deserve a shout out. And my final one, I don't know whether you saw, did you see um, one of the great Towsery merchants in our game, um, uh, Emmy Martinez, of, <laughs> obviously the goalkeeper, Aston Villa, at the end. And I thought it was really refreshing, actually, because the interview asked, asked him, can Aston Villa win the league? Do you believe? And he went, yeah, I'm a believer, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of a brummy accent in there as well, I think, from, from him. He's been there a while. Um, and, and that's quite refreshing, because normally you say, no, well, no, let's be, let's, let, let's, be, let's be humble. Let's take one game at a time. He went, no, nope, I'm a believer, mate. Yeah, of course we can. <laughs> 
I like his I like his attitude. Yeah, me man. too. I like I watching like him. It. I don't mind a bit of that. Yeah, yeah a bit of that I like it. I like it. Housery yeah. and stuff on the and he does it on the pitch, does he, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> what about he was celebrating at the World Cup when he was? Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's a character let's say that he's a he character is. did I did I hear I think I heard on the news correctly this morning saying that Girona have never finished inside the top 10 oh they've only they've only I think this is only like the second or third season I think in, in the top flight in their history I mean it's 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 mad um, and it's a, it's a tiny tiny little club and obviously they that was you know, the new thing, the Catalan derby, they call it. It was never <laughs> such a thing. Um, it used to be Espanyol in Barcelona. Now it seems to have become uh, Girona. Um, amazing. Um, up there in the Costa Brava there. A uh, couple of players of we might know. Daily Blind's yeah. there. Yes. Eric Garcia is there. Yeah. Yeah. Gazanega is there as well. I or Gazaniga. Gazaniga. Uh, Oh, I, love it when you, I love it when you do your homework, Michael. Oh, we try it. Come on. on. No. <laughs> you see him looking at his notes. Yeah, we all right now. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, they've been excellent, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep an eye on that uh, particular story. Um, but I think that draws us to a close. We'll be back with our questions episode uh, on Wednesday. Um, thank again for sending all those questions in. They're terrific, and your continued support of the podcast. Um, we 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 absolutely appreciate it. Um, but for now, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Have a good week. <laughs>